Welcome again, saints. It is your dearest servant, Brother Pastor Brian Dell of the St. Mark Baptist Church, located in Waterloo, Iowa. Let me pray for us, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just thank you again for allowing us, uh, Lord, to gather on this platform, Lord, wherever this uh, video will be seen or the sound file will be heard. Lord, we just thank you, Father. I just thank you, Lord, for the recent blessings, Lord, in, in my own life, Father. Ed. We just thank you, Lord. I thank you that at this time, anyway, uh, you've allowed me, Lord, to lead your people, Father, to teach them, Lord, to guide them. It's past, but I just thank you for this season, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for right now, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Saints, today is lesson nine. We got kind of a short lesson today, uh, January 30th, 2022, and we're still in unit two, uh, God, the source of justice and counter. And the title of today's lesson is Counterculture Compassion. The devotional reading is Luke uh, chapter nine, verses one through 17. The background scriptures is Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 21. And the print passage is Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 21. And the key verse says, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. And we just want to go back, and I just want to go back one lesson today because we, I got on something, a recording, a sound file that uh, I didn't deliver anyway to uh, the video audience. And I thought it like really important, but the spirit will do, right? With the, what the spirit will do. So I wanted to just talk to you as well. And I, I, I mentioned it, but I didn't dig deep into it. So I want to spend the next few minutes going over uh, le lesson eight, January 23rd. And we were talking about incorruptible leaders. And before that uh, lesson, we actually were talking about unbiased actions as well. And if you remember, that would have been around the 9th of January, something like that. So we talked about unbiased actions, and then we folded that into incorruptible leaders. And because, you know, your dear servant told you all of these things work together. You say, we remember scripture, Romans 8, 28, but we don't know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and to the good of them that are called according to his purpose. All of that good has to begin with his word. Why? Because that's where it began. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And remember, everything he created was, uh, that, that we are here was, was what? He spoke that into existence. Now it's interesting, he spoke the platform, the environment into existence. But when it came down to his own image and after his own likeness, he took a hands-on approach. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll talk about that another time. Right. But nevertheless, we folded unbiased actions into incorruptible leaders. And at the time I was encouraging you now we're incorruptible leaders is that. And as I said, with the sound file, it was that we a lot, we a lot of times we don't appreciate incorruptible leaders or we don't honor them as much as we honor those ones that have corrupted themselves. It's just true. And what I said about that and I said that it seems as if. Uh, the men of God, many men of God who are standing on the wall, and there may be some personality conflicts, whatever that is, but they're standing on righteousness. It seems like those are the ones that de the demons in the church, the hellbound church members, the reprobate deacons, the reprobate trustees, the reprobate committee heads, the reprobates, uh, the children of the devil. Those are Jesus's words, right? Because they do the will of their father, the devil, because they're lying. And the devil is the father of lies. So since he's the father of lies and they're running around in the church telling lies about the man of God, because as the list says, he's not un, because he's incorruptible. They're the children of lies and the children of the devil. And we talked about biased actions with respect that when somebody says something, when a leader presents something to us and we don't like it, doesn't mean that it's unrighteous. It means that we don't like it. We tend we tend to try to stand against those leaders, like Lesson 8, that are incorruptible, that God himself, through his spoken word, has set up. But yet, it is those that are corrupted that we don't tend necessarily to try to come at, come against, to throw them out necessarily. I'm not saying it always happens, but what I am saying is even like uh, nationally, uh, even locally, Whatever that is, it seems as if those people, those church leaders, those pastors that are running around doing whatever they want to do outside of the marriage, uh, lying, robbing people, taking money, 
doing all sorts of nonsense that ain't got nothing to do with nothing. Strong arming people, emotionally blackmailing people, doing all of these things. Those are the ones that seem to be prospering, while the ones that are standing on righteousness are the ones that are catching hell. And it's, it's, it's interesting because Jesus told his disciples when they stand, would stand on righteousness, he said, if they will hate me, they will hate you because a servant can't be greater than their masters. And I said that, saints, to point out that we are talking about unbiased actions. And if you are going to stand against corruption, stand against corruption, if you are going to allow somebody to, to preach to you about corruption, and if they are themselves corrupt, God's justice being the source of justice, which is the title of this whole series of lessons, if they're the source of justice, you have to righteously judge and you have to righteously administer justice from God's word, according to Matthew chapter 18, against those corrupted leaders. Therefore, you should also stand with those that are preaching righteousness, preaching judgment, preaching justice, walking out that thing, and you should stand with them and pray for them, but that's not what's happening. What's happening is, and we're talk, we're still on these uh, incorruptible leaders. What's happened is the, the ones that are incorruptible are catching hell from the chairman of the deacon board, catching hell from deacons, catching hell from trustees. I even I was at a church and serving with a pastor uh, in Denver, Colorado, and man, this brother was standing on righteousness. He just was. He was my hero. He was a, he was a beast, and he, he, he had grace about it. He ain't like me. He wasn't going to swing swords and draw blood in the spirit. He was graceful about it, right? And I watched them, this incorruptible leader. I watched them. I watched his love offering. Dude had three kids, young wife, himself. I watched him whittle his love offering down to $60 a week. Because he was incorruptible. Because they were trying to starve him out. Because reprobate deacons and reprobate trustees came against him because they, he, they wanted to control the direction of the church. The pastor's like, no, this is where we need to go. This is what God showed us. And I watched them do that. They brought a corrupted leader in after that. Woo, boy, they were paying him. But he was a puppet. He was corrupted. He was one of those ones that was with the pastor in the heat of the fight. And all of a sudden he disappeared. And they brought him back after they threw the pastor out. Woo, they treated him like a king. I'm sure at some point they wore him out because that's what them sorts do. And I'm going somewhere. We're talking about incorruptible and corruptible leaders here before we go down to today. And we're talking about unbiased actions and how any leaders in the church, whether it be trustees, whether it be deacons, have to show unbiased actions according to God's justice. And here was the thing. People that are not about God isn't the source of their justice. This is what the lessons are about. They're not the source. God's not the source. The Holy Spirit's not the source of them. They put their mouth on the man of God. They'll throw out the man of God. I, I saw my pastor, this man in Denver, I, I saw that happen to him too. They put theirs, these spiritual cannibals. That's what you are. You're spiritual cannibals. They, they taste after they throw out the man of God. They destroy him financially. They destroy his family. They, destroy, they, they bring hell into his marriage. They do all of these things. These reprobate church leaders, beacon boards, trustees. That's who you are. Reprobates. They get this taste of the man of God's flesh in their mouth. Because they've thrown him out. They've shown him who's in charge. Now, I ain't saying God told them to. I'm saying they showed him who was in charge. There, there was this, this, these people, and they were in a situation in a snowstorm. They couldn't get out. People start dying. True story. And they, the, the bodies were frozen, and they were starved. They didn't have food and water. They start eating snow and water, but they needed food, so they start eating the frozen flesh of other human dead bodies because they have nothing else to eat. They came down out of the mountain were rescued, most of them, or some of them. And this is what the, this one man said all 30 years later. He said, once I ate that flesh of a human, I knew it was taboo, but I 
had to do it to stay alive. They felt. He said, I never got that taste out of my mouth. And they developed, he said, I developed a yearning for that. And he said, I haven't done it since, but that yearning is still there. The same thing happens in the spirit when these reprobates can't, and we're talking about it, lesson eight here, corruptible, incorruptible leaders, when they can't, when once they taste the flesh and they show the man of God what's what and they throw him out and they bring a usurper, a hireling in, anybody you bring in after a real man of God because you've thrown him out, God sent them there, you've thrown him out, you brought in who you want to, they're a hireling. I don't care how good they are. I don't care how credentialed they are. They're standing in the place of the man of God. That congregation I told you about and I'm going to move on here because I got to encourage you. This is not a game. That same, those same people that threw out my pastor, they got called me. They tried to call me. Hey, hey Reverend Dale, I'm 32. I ain't, I've been preaching one year. Hey, Reverend Dale, what you going down? You know, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm going, I'm, I'm going down there to preach repentance to these children of the devil. But they, when I got down there, they were going to try to get me to stand in the place of the man of God. I turned my car around. The spirit let me know they didn't listen to the man I sent them. They're not going to listen to anything you have to say. So what I'm saying is, not only did they throw out the man of God, not only did they get the taste of flesh in their mouth of the man of God once they showed him, they bring in these hirelings to take the place of the man of God. And these hirelings who come in afterwards always get worn out. Because they're standing somewhere that God didn't ordain for them. Everything that happens is God's will. Sure about that? I'm not going to go into that. Everything that happens is God's will. Because if you believe everything that happens is God's will, you must believe that sin is his will. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit and God warned them not to do it, you have to, if everything's God's will, you have to believe that that's his will as well. There's a difference between something being his will and he, him using that thing for his will. Again, today, those of you who are incorruptible, you stand on the wall. Remember Psalms 37 tells you to fret not, fret not yourself because of evildoers, because they will soon be cut down like the grass. Those hirelings, and the Bible says, the Gospel of John says, they don't care for the sheep because they see the wolf coming and they don't do anything. They don't know how to fight wolves. You know why? Because they are wolves. In order for them to fight wolves, they would have to start chewing on their, chewing on their own legs because they're a wolf. They had to start punching themselves in the face because they're a wolf. Lesson 9, January 30th, 2022. God, the source of justice. Counterculture, compassion. Devotional reading, Luke 9, 1 through 17. The background scripture is Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 21. The print passage is Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 21. And the key verse, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. And the lesson aims. As a result of experiencing this lesson, you should be able to do these things. Explore God's standard for justice. Appreciate how God loves those who are poor and marginalized. Wow. Share love with those who are rejected by others. And the introduction, the lesson's title is Counterculture Compassion. Just what does that mean in the context of God's requirement for justice? Counterculture is an adjective describing a subculture whose lifestyle or values uh, reject or oppose the dominant values and behavior of society. Compassion is a sympath um, symp uh, sympathetic awareness of others' distress together with the desire to alleviate. In this context, counterculture compassion is the actions of those within the dominant culture to oppose the denial of social justice for the distressed and the marginalized. This is an apt description of believers, a subculture with values opposed to those of the world. The world oppresses the powerless because of race, ethnicity, economic status, and often their religious affiliations. There are those who demonstrate sympathetic concern, but are wholly unmotivated to act toward removing the causes of these distressful situations. Israel uh, was a Canaanite subculture. Israel was a Canaanite subculture with the spiritual values radically different from those of other nations in Canaan. Through Moses, God gave specific um, commandments to follow to avoid taking advantage of the marginalized and understand how to share their resources with them. Woo. 
two, God expects believers to avoid all forms of antagonistic economic pressure uh, and the withholding of resources from the poor. Believers are commanded to be in the world, but not of it, and to set the example of a counterculture compassion. That's just saying, saints, and you know the scripture says before I move on here that we are a royal, a, a, a peculiar people, the Bible says, uh, a royal priesthood. And when it talks about a, a counterculture, an example of that in the American ethos, if you will, happened in the eh, mid to late 1960s, on going on to the 70s too, and they were called hippies. They were the, what was called the counterculture of that time. They were people typically born in the mid 1940s or the 1940s, all the way up to about 1952, 53, anyway, 54, 55, maybe. And that generation totally rejected the values of their parents, not the entire generation, but enough of them to be noticeable. Um, but they rejected that 1940s and 1950s mom at home cooking in the new house. And now these are good Christians. <laughs> I ain't talking about us. And we, you know, we, a few of us, we always go along with that, that, that uh, nonsense of good Christians. Do you know there was black folks, a few black people at the Capitol on January 6th running in there with those good Christians and now face charges? It's, 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 it's always a couple of us <laughs> that trying to fit in. But anyway, that, that hippie counterculture throughout the 1960s, they had long hair. They lived in places like Haight-Ashbury, which is a section of San Francisco. Uh, they were hitchhiking on the side of the road. They came. You, you've heard of some of the bands that actually sprang from the early parts of that movement, like the Beatles with their long hair and doing those things. You even remember some shows uh, that kind of hinted towards that, which was one was like Gilligan's Island, these sorts of things. So counter, they were so different than the prevailing culture that people kind of took notice of them. They, they were stuck, they stuck out, they, they would say like a sore thumb. That ought to be not the model for us, but I'm just giving you a comparison. For us, we ought to uh, be those count, that counterculture as well, that wherever we go, Anyway, our light shines, right? So we are to be that, that peculiar people that the Bible describes. And if we bring in unbiased actions from two weeks ago, the lesson from two weeks ago, our actions should be so just that pe and our judgment so right and our justice administered so just that people understand that we are not biased people at all, who God is not biased as well with respect to his salvation that he offered. Remember, the Bible says, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whole world, whosoever, shows there's no bias. Jesus himself said, come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus also said to, the, to the, uh, uh, Israel, he said, I have sheep that are not of this fold to attend to as well. Jesus, and the Bible also tells us anyway that whosoever shall call on the name, whosoever again, shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I'm saying that to prove that our, the God we serve is unbiased according to the, to the manifestation and the bestowing of our inheritance through the free gift of salvation. People ought to look at us as different as well because we are love each other so much. We are so just. Remember, Jesus said they. The people, the outside will know you are my disciples by your love one for another. And that love one for another comes, part of it comes from a place of rendering truth and love through judgment as well as administering godly justice. Now, when I talk about justice, I'm not always talking about punishment. No, sir, we. I am also talking, when I talk about justice, I'm also talking about being just. Here's a way that you can be just. Administer God's justice without ever raising your hand or mouth to somebody. Being just is understanding oftentimes that God brought you from somewhere, delivered you from something. And when you see somebody struggling with the same thing, if you are going to be just in your judgment of them, mercy and grace has to be a component of that. Because you realize what they're struggling with because God has brought you from that same place. 
that saints is something that should stick out to people and should be called as our lesson today is counterculture compassion. There's some things that I know God has dealt with me on and even though I don't do them anymore, I'm going to have, I'm going to be just with people that struggle with it. Again, alcoholism. I'm going to be just when I deal. I'm not raising my hand to people that are getting a sip on and getting a perv on simply because I know when that monkey was on my back, how bad I struggled and how difficult it was for, for God to bring me out of that because I wanted to stay. It wasn't difficult for him. It was difficult for me to reach my hand out and accept that gift of coming out. So that is justice also without ever raising your mouth or ever raising your hand to somebody. Justice isn't always administering punishment. It's also administering grace and it's also administering mercy. And the analysis of the biblical text, Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 13 says, when you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into the house to get it, uh, to get what is offered to you as a pledge. Stay outside and let your neighbor know to whom you are making the loan, bringing the pledge out to you. If the neighbor is poor, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your possession. Return their coat. Well, let's say it like this. Return the possession by sunset so your neighbor may sleep. Then they will thank you and it will regard it as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord. And, and part of what it's saying before we get to the description is you shouldn't always withhold something from somebody because you think you deserve to withhold it. Because the fact is, if any, if any being in the universe ever deserved to withhold something from you and I. It is the God we serve because of our wickedness. But yet he didn't withhold his own son in our cause. And the description, this quote from Immanuel Kant is a fitting summary of Deuteronomy 24. Act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your person or in the person of another, never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end. God, the author and source of justice expects that believers never treat others as if they have no value or use them to achieve selfish aims. His instructions to Israel prohibited the practice of all forms of social injustice. And saints, just stop there really quick. I want, part of my heart's desire is, is to teach God's people in such a way that they themselves will be freed from burdens that have been tied on them which those who tied on them, as the Bible says, cannot remove those burdens with one finger, right? So some things that we've been burdened down with that really are unscriptural. And I say that because when we talk about justice here, there are, it talk, and it talks about social justice. We as black people are great about screaming for social justice, right? especially with respect to Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, which will be tomorrow. I'm recording this lesson just a few weeks early. We are great at demanding social justice of white folks. Some of us are even great at demanding social justice within our own community with the killing, the murder, the leaving our sisters to raise kids alone, all these sorts of things. A few of us are. But when it comes to demanding social justice inside of the house of God or equity, let's, let's frame social justice as providing equity. But in the house of God, we create, remember we talked about by un, uh, biased actions and unbiased actions. We, we create this hierarchy that, of, of spiritualness that God never meant to be created. Or we try to elevate some people above other people in the congregation, believing that preferring these people over others is pleasing to God when his word clearly tells us to not prefer one person over another. We clearly know that his word says that he is not a respecter of persons. We clearly know that when he gave the gifts of uh, church building, which when he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 4, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. We go on over in Acts in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, I believe, is we can bring deacons into that as well. But deacons aren't called by God. These church leaders typically are. Now, many of them are, not all of them. Some of them were sent and some of them just went. And what we and I said that to point that out is that the establishment, Paul was talking about the establishment of those gifts. And he was talking about how God gave these things. And he ultimately, Paul said they are for the edifying of the church and the building of the body of Christ. 
Then when we talk, we bring these other gifts in, the gifts of God, uh, knowledge, healing, uh, tongues, miracles, all of these gifts that God gives the body as well. We find out that all of these gifts are equally required or how will the body function? Here's, here's an example. Apostles, not going to go into whether apostles still exist or, or not right now. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, you know, it would be, people could say what they want about that. We'll get into that uh, another time. However, apostles are actually church planners. We, we have people that call themselves apostles today and never planted a church but go around like an evangelist, but call themselves apostles. Okay, let's talk about this. Apostles are church planners, right? We know what prophets do. They call God's people back to righteousness with the sword and with the spear and doing everything they can do in the spirit, preaching to get people's, uh, God's people to come back to them. They are God's warriors. They are bearers of the sword. They will be frontline, they will be frontline infantry people. If we could put it in military terms, they're out there. Bah, 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 bah. They're out there doing the work. You understand? That's what they do. They call people apostle plants. The prophet calls the planet back to righteousness as New Testament. Then we got the evangelist who go who by who by definition goes to get the people to put in the church, the apostle planet, who when they're out of the way, the prophet calls them back. And we got the leader of the local congregation that the apostle planted. Mm -hmm. that the prophet calls back when necessary, that the evangelist goes get to populate those places, which is the pastor teacher. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> Please forward this to your pastor. Tell him, say, oh, this preacher, tell you. yeah, this is what he said. Yeah, that's how it goes. That's the biblical definition. Now, where am I going with this? The point is that all of equity cannot exist if we don't understand that all of those gifts, even what gifts in the congregation especially, even when those gifts aren't pulled into those church administrative or those church uh, those church building gifts that I just told you, uh, certainly if fruits of the Spirit don't come into that, patience, long-suffering, kindness, if those don't come into that place where those, pl where those gifts are operating, which those other gifts are brought in from the congregation. Saints, there can be no equity and there can be no justice. And the reason is when we hold people up and we believe that church leaders, for instance, are seen as more special to God than you are, we will never be able to equitably apply his word. Therefore, we will never be the lights that so shine. Because people are used to going to the, into the world and being told that their CEOs are better than them. The people that are uh, 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 in our town out there at Tyson, meat plant, they're used to looking up in the windows in the office to the people that are making more money and are told that they matter more than they do. What if there was a culture that existed within this world that said everybody is equal, though some may, may be more accountable? Saints, that is what people want to see. People want to be welcomed in. They need to see something different than the world offers them. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, given in a just and uh, just manner. Can we provide that? That's the question. What do you think? How is it possible to perform compassionate deeds and ways that disrespect the dignity of those receiving it. Again, how is it possible to perform compassionate deeds in a way that disrespects the dignity of those receiving them? There's a difference in going to uh, a homeless person and saying to them, and I used to work with the homeless people, saying to them, hey, here's a bowl of soup, man, I, I know uh, you know you're struggling, but hey, man, here's a bowl of soup, man, to warm you up. Rather than somebody that goes to a bowl of soup and say, I know you want this soup with your trifling behind. You need to go get a job. They, uh, again, when we talk about that, uh, we can perform compassionate deeds in ways that don't, res uh, that don't disrespect the dignity of those receiving them. A lot of people struggle with uh, receiving assistance, financial assistance from the church because they feel like failures. How do you as a congregation soothe those concerns with those people and not disrespect their dignity? That's just kind of, for me anyway, with that thing is rhetorical. And then uh, the uh, analysis of the biblical text, workers' compensation and family uh, preservation do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether 
that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner in one of your towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and are counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you, and you may be guilty of sin. Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die in their own sin. Do not deprive foreigners or the fatherless of justice. And I, I want to say this, and I'm now I'm going to switch because here's, here's the truth. The truth is I am hard on church leaders. I am hard on them. I know it, but God, I told you, God created me to go to them and say, hey, there's a better way. Uh, God's not pleased with what you're doing, but there's grace on the other side of this brother or sister, if that's your thing. Come on back to him. I'm hard on them. I'm a savage on them. Not just here on whatever platform you hear this on. I'm a savage to their face. I have to be. That's what it is. But I also want to be fair to some of those same leaders. And I'm going to go here and I'm going to go in on you, God's sheep, real quick in the name of Jesus. I just told you about a pastor that a congregation in Denver, Colorado tried to starve out. I saw it. I was there when he counted his little $40, $30, $60, whatever it was, some weeks. You know, my family, there were some of us that were, you know. But he needed consistent income. And I was there when he counted his little $40 with his three toddlers, even if he didn't have three toddlers, even if he was single. You know, you're trying to pay this dude $160 or this group, $160. Is, is that what you're doing in an expensive place like Denver, Colorado? So... There are leaders like that out there that can be considered, and it talked about a hired servant that is poor. Do you really believe that every person standing behind that lectern is getting money? That's a lie from the pit of hell. I know pastors that are paying to keep the lights on for the people that they lead. That's fine. But when it comes to those people, I want to challenge you, saints of God, and call you back and don't always consider, thou shalt not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy. I don't always want you to consider that that's the person to your left and right because sometimes that's the leader in your pulpit. They need to go get a job. Oh, oh, okay, we'll have that discussion another time. Let, let's have that another time. I'm talking to the people that can't afford to do it and you're not. I'm going to press forward at that. You can go back in every Sunday school lesson I've ever taught over the last two or three years. You've never heard me challenge you in the area of finances. Mm -mm, you the sheep. I haven't. But would you consider, now, I'm, I'm going to do this in two parts. Preachers are human. I'm human. Sometimes bitterness sets into us. Bitterness, discouragement, and disappointment come into our lives. And at that time, we're not able to control that. And we get worse and worse and worse. There were many men of God that started out with a great warfare. Many church leaders, pastors. And they got to a point in ministry where people that were able to bless them. Again, thou shalt not oppress a hired servant. That's what the lesson said. This, this hired servant could be your pastor. That started out and they realized over years that you, God's people, were never going to do right by them. And they became bitter. And they became angry. And now you're dealing with a bitter, angry pastor. Now, is that his fault or your fault? I would say blame lies at both of your doors, but I will say this. I've also taught you in these Sunday school lessons. I'm on topic here. Workers' compensation and family preservation. I'm on topic. I would say this. There is a time to get righteously angry. Now, it shouldn't lead to the root of bitterness. That's when the Bible talks about be angry and sin not. Because when I'm angry and I get out of God's will, that's when I'm sinning. The root of bitterness is, is, is sin. So would you consider right now in the name of Jesus praying right where you are and saying, God, was I a part of creating this monster that now stands in front of me? Because I can tell you this, there is a well-earned level from your, some of your church leaders. And I ain't talking about the pimps. I ain't talking about them. I'm going to talk about the rest. I'm talking about the real ones that are struggling right now. There is solid 
evidence that I've seen with my own eyes that there's a level of distrust of you, God's people, and your ability or your, not in your ability or your willingness to do what God's word says about them that labor in the gospel are worthy of double tribute about this. You shall not oppress the hired servant about a workman being worthy of their wages and the servant of their hire. I could go on. There is evidence that there's a high level of distrust between you, God's people, and your leaders. And some of your leaders' anger is well-founded. And I support it. And I will continue to support a hostile leader in the spirit that is being robbed and stolen from by a reprobate congregation like the one in, I was a part of in Denver, Colorado. Before I move on, all I'm asking you today is this. Go to the Lord and ask him, were you a part of creating that monster that stands in front of you? Now, I know what the Bible says about sin lying to your door. I knew what the Bible says about those who know to do right and do it not to them and to sin. And I'm talking about your leaders now. Yes, they may be in a place of sin. But is there some reconciliation and some healing with respect to how you financially treat them that needs to happen? I'm not a preacher that talks about finances. I'm not ashamed to do it. But I'm going to stomp them out in the spirit, your leaders, when they are wicked. But I also recognize that their lack of trust of some of these congregations nationally, statewide, and even locally is well earned. I'm going to tell you this too, and I'm going to move on. For those of you with parsonages, you church with parsonage, how many of you have noticed, and I'm talking nationally, I'm here on YouTube, I'm talking 2,000 subscribers or 3,000, whatever that number is right now. How many of you that have been on ba ba uh, pastoral search committees have had your favorite candidate refuse to live in a parsonage? Do you want me to tell you why? Or you lost a candidate because they, the right candidate, because they refused to live in your parsonage. You want to tell you why? Because we know how many of you are. And the worst case scenario to us is being put out and not having, and we know how ignorant a lot of y'all get because you will not only put us out of the church, you will show up the next day at these parsonages and try to throw us and our families out in the street. Yeah, I go in on crooked leaders, but I understand why some of them are where they are. All I'm saying before I move on and close this lesson out is go to the Lord and ask him, is there reconciliation to be had? And did you have any part of the lack of trust that has developed between your leaders and you because of something financially you've, according to God's word here, that you've withheld from them. I don't have these financial conversations, and I'm just going to be transparent about it with the church I pastor. I don't have these conversations with them. You know why? I don't have to have these conversations with them because they have been a blessing to their pastor. They have. And I ain't talking about money. And I'm not talking about money. I don't make enough to live doing that. I'm talking about their desire to be a blessing to me. Not that they, not, not that they can do all they want to, but they have a desire. Does your congregation, even though you have short resources, $50 a week, you're giving them a hundred dollars, whatever it is you're giving them. Do you have the desire to do more and refuse to and wonder why they are bitter? Ooh. Announcements of biblical text as we close. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olive from your trees and do not go over the branches a second time, leave what remains for the foreigners and the fatherless and the widows. Saints, as I go down to the last, what do you think? Switching back to the congregation. What is it that we are not doing for the needy among us, whether it's a church leader, whether it's a congregation, and yes, there are needy church leaders out there because they've sacrificed in order to be able to pastor you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for this lesson today. Lord, oftentimes there's hard things that need to be said, Lord, but they're loving and they're just. Father, I just pray that wherever this lesson goes, Father, you just, Lord, bless the hearers, Lord, that we're challenged, Lord, in every area. Father, I just pray right now for healing, um, for, for your leaders, Lord, church leaders, Lord, that have the root of bitterness in their life because a congregation 
had the ability to supply and didn't or didn't even or couldn't and didn't even have the desire to. But yet they're, they're there, Lord, but they're, they're struggling with burnout. They're struggling with bitterness. They're struggling with anger. They, they, they have left, Lord, who you called them to be. Father, I just pray for them right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, I just thank you and praise you, Lord, for, Lord, the congregation that you allow me to lead, Lord, for their, Lord, desire in that area. And Father, that they know my heart and that they know, uh, Lord, that I would do what I do for nothing. But Lord, they refuse to allow that, uh, me to do that. I thank you, Lord, for them. Lord, I pray that spirit in all of our churches, Lord, especially here, especially locally, Lord, uh, in Waterloo, Iowa. Father, there, there are shepherds, Lord, real shepherds, Lord, that are coming up out the pocket to keep the lights on. Lord, there are real shepherds, Lord, that have not experienced, Lord, uh, that, from the, that, that part of giving from their congregations. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, uh, Lord, that if you have planted them, Father, that their needs, as the old preacher said, will be, Lord, increased or their needs will be provided for. Father, bless all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. And so be it. Thank you.